had a nice lunch. Uh, we're gonna stay on schedule for the rest of the afternoon. I am really excited about this next session. Uh, so coming on with us is uh, Priyanka Patel. She is heads up the innovation team for uh, the Kenyan Red Cross Society. And she has been developing and spearheading an initiative that helps us understand how we can leverage decentralized identity uh, to help uh, refugees. And uh, she's gonna talk to us about what they've done today, live pilots they've run, and her plans for the future. Um, and then there is a plea at the end, which I hope you all uh, heed to, is to contact her, help and support the efforts that they're doing in Africa. So, uh, and specifically Kenya and the cross-border relationship. So with that in mind, let's uh, kick off uh, from Priyanka. Hello everyone, uh, so I'm Priyanka Patel, I'm the Innovation Manager at the Red Cross Society. I'm really happy to join you virtually as much as I can join physically, um, but I'm really hoping what I'm about to share with you. Um, so dignified identity for vulnerable communities. This is something that is very dear to us at uh, the Kenya Red Cross, but also the, the IFRC, uh, the larger uh, international federation of the Red Cross uh, and the Red Cross and societies. Um, so in, in terms of what we mean by digital identity, it's always about us moving around and using our national ID, using our passports uh, for basic services that we need. And when you think about these women that you see in this photo, or even the refugees that you think of, um, they are at a disadvantage of services and being able to be supported by humanitarian organizations just because they miss a national ID. So what I'm here to tell you today is when we think about uh, digital identities and digital solutions, it is something that we started with the Norwegian Red Cross, the IFRC Innovation Norway Save the Children, Norwegian Refugee Council, as well as Norwegian Church Aid. And it's a project we started in 2018. This consortium looked into how can we test something that is uh, digital, that is dignified, because creating identities needs to be with dignity. Um, how do we test this in the context of how major organizations work? So in that case, Kenya has been working uh, within the communities with cash assistance. So what we do is anytime there's a disaster, we are able to transfer cash to the affected households. Uh, we do this through mobile money. And when we send money through mobile money, of course, the person on the other hand needs to have access to a mobile phone, but also a SIM card where they are able to receive the transaction. But if you don't have a, a national ID, then you can't have a national, I mean, you can't have a SIM card, which means you cannot receive the mobile transfer from our side. You have to then go to a nearby uh, shop where we do an airdrop of uh, the, the, the cash, and then you get to withdraw from them. So what we did is when you have national IDs and you want to try and support the community that does not have national ID or any form of official ID, you need to think of a solution that is going to support and dignify them with an identification platform where humanitarian services can be supported, but at the same time you are also respecting the government rules and regulations. So we tried to do a pilot uh, in the year 2018. Of course, COVID did affect us as well uh, in the pilot implementation. So we did our first implementation in the cash assistance context, uh, where we ensured that as we are delivering uh, national IDs or digital IDs in that case to the beneficiaries, we're able to store their information that is only relevant for the project implementation. So if you look at the objectives even that have been listed here, we're trying to make sure that these uh, digital IDs are enabling beneficiaries to receive humanitarian assistance basically through credentials that indicate that they are eligible. I'll give you a quick scenario. When you have a, a fire situation in a household, I mean a community, the chances are out of the 10 households, only three households have been affected. But when it comes to reporting, six of them will come to our, 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 our door and tell us that all of our households have been affected. But how do you verify this? Because there's no form of identification. Um, different people can come in and use different names, or one person can carry four different names, and you don't have any way of justifying or, I mean, you know, canceling out this person has already received assistance before. Um, so this helps us, you know, make sure that the beneficiaries are eligible for the assistance that we're supporting for. Um, but we also have beneficiaries uh, access and control their own data. 
So at any time we want to access the information through this platform, we need the beneficiary next to us and they need to give us consent because there's a certain code that comes onto their device which they give us access to and then they help us pin in the, the code and read their information. Um, of course, this entire process helps with the data protection, it helps the data privacy and security because at the end of the day, the user, the community member, is the owner of their data as it should be. We are not the owners as humanitarian practitioners. We should not take ownership of data, uh, especially that does not belong to us, but the community. We ensure that the, these solutions are working in the low connectivity area because that is the, the most important thing for us. When you deliver such digital platforms, um, as much as they're here to solve or you know fill a gap, if they're not easily accessible in the presence of low connection, then it's not sustainable. So this is a solution that has been tested for a number of years, and at least probably we can say it does not meet strong internet connectivity anymore. But the idea is that this becomes interoperable. And I think even the discussion we've had earlier uh, with, with Michael, thank you, uh, is this is a solution that can become the universal and the central humanitarian identification platform. Uh, the idea is, just like a Red Cross National Society, and you all are familiar with the, what the Red Cross and the Red Cross and National Societies do across the globe, but the idea is that what we do in humanitarian support and humanitarian activities should cut across what every other humanitarian actor and partner does. We should not be having different organizations, different NGOs registering different identifications for health credentials, for wash credentials, for cash credentials. It just becomes a very tedious exercise for beneficiaries to constantly give their data every single time to different departments. But this, this, this method helps us restore their dignity but also able to support them on a continuous flow. So in terms of how this smart uh, solution works is we use smartphones but also featured phones. But in the case of also having no phones, the, the photo you see the lady holding is uh, a sample of the digital uh, ID. Uh, it has a QR code that is then printed on it, so you can present this and come to, uh, to our stations and you can access services. Uh, we do a data collection, we create their digital ID and give them the, the PIN, of course we, we issue them their PINs. Um, we issue the credentials as well in form of the QR, so there's no uh, risk of data uh, leak, there's a data privacy uh, security on that. And then there's a valid verification that you have registered and you are eligible to the services of the Kenya Red Cross in this case. Um, the, we've tested this use case, at least at the Kenya Red Cross, we've tested this in two use cases um, in the cash assistance. We've done this in the informal settlements of Nairobi, where we gave uh, cash disbursements to the community using this identification system as the, the basis of identifying the beneficiaries. And then we use this to, to distribute the, the mobile money. But of course, this is also within a closed loop approach, because at that stage and even to date, the lawyer customers rules and regulations doesn't allow us to use any other form of ID as a point of issuing SIM cards. So we, this was a closed loop where they gave us a, a number of SIM cards registered to our organization, and then we were able to sample test and see how this would work. It had we taken this approach in a more open loop uh, implementation. And then we've done the same uh, solution we've used it in the healthcare uh, context uh, for both the host migrant refugees and asylum seekers in a refugee camp which is based in Turkana and in the Kalobe uh, settlement areas. So in Kalobe and in Kakuma, where there's the host communities, uh, in Kalobe we have a health clinic. And in the host community area, we have a private uh, health clinic by an external corporate client. So what we did is in the health clinic in Kalobe, we had 47 refugees coming to, to constantly for medical assistance. And these were NCP patients with diabetes and hypertension. So these, uh, you know, uh, digital identity solution was used to create health credentials and store it in their digital wallets. So they were issued the digital wallets and anytime they come to our clinics, they're able to access their information so that the, the medical practitioner doesn't have to redo the entire process of testing this person and understanding what their life conditions are. Um, they are able to save on time, they're able to also attend to them and not uh, you know, just give a misconsultation for in terms of misdiagnosis of what the issue may be, but the doctor is able to see what their underlying condition is and prescribe medication accordingly. 
Uh, we've done this in a simulation exercise with the South Sudan Red Crescent as well. In the case of if you have refugees that move between the borders from Kenya and South Sudan, what would the scenario look like in that case? The idea is when refugees move from one country to another, they should be able to share their information at the next at the next station. So, for instance, if I'm moving from Kenya and going to South Sudan, I may not remember that I have diabetes or what is the exact medication that I was taking, but my my digital wallet. Uh, can be accessed by the South Sudan Red Crescent after I gave consent. <coughs> and they're able to see my underlying conditions and prescribe my medications accordingly. It also reduces the language barrier uh, disadvantages because the, the card and the digital identity does the speaking for you. So you're also able to then uh, make sure the right health services are offered and supported to the, to the beneficiaries. Of course, it's been a rough journey to where we've reached right now. We've had a lot of bumps on the way and we still face them. Um, it is a solution that is not entirely uh, developed or, well, the, the infrastructure has not been done by us. We've got Gravity Earth, who has come in as a consultant that we uh, recruited to help us design and set up this platform. Um, but the lessons that we've learned along the way is Definitely lack of identity exacerbates the vulnerability because if you don't have any identification, you can get arrested anytime, you can get confined anytime, you're, you're not on services, um, you have a certain tag, and it's just it's a lot of issues that come in with a lack of identification. Uh, you can think about being in a tra traveling into a country and then not having your passport next to you, and you panic because you can't receive any services if you have no form of identification. So uh, data protection is definitely key and sensitive because when humanitarian actors are working in this space of digital identities, it's very, very easy to make data um, insensitive. Like it's just a blink of an eye and data can get lost or can get misused. So data protection is very key and very sensitive. So we have done data protection impact assessments at every pilot stage and in every year to make sure that we're abiding uh, by our policies and rules and regulations. Um, advocacy with the government is so, so, so important, um, especially with major organizations and other service providers, because everyone tends to work in silos, and then the humanitarian actors are not entirely speaking to one another or are competing in the space of digital identification, and it's causing a, sort of a leverage for the government at some point in some countries where the, they're not looking at the, at the holistic approach, they're not looking at the, at the larger picture of what this could be, and there's so much potential for something like this. So advocating at the government stage is very important, and that is what we've actually started doing since last year, trying to make them understand the process, trying to make them uh, buy into the idea of creating humanitarian, dignified, or digital identities. Um, this is a platform that can definitely be integrated with third-party systems. So, for instance, uh, within the Kenya Red Cross, we have emergency medical systems uh, in the refugee camp uh, clinic. The idea is how do we integrate the digital uh, IDs into this platform. So even as they come to access services, of course, their information is stored in the, in the emergency medical system. But the digital identity also reflects the same. So at any point when they travel off, the, the EMS system is able to then translate the information uh, onto their digital identity for the country that they are then being served in. So this is where the interoperability comes in. And what I strongly personally believe is it is definitely a great solution. But if we don't get more humanitarian organizations and practitioners to be part of this, then everything that we're doing is, is worth nothing, literally. Because if we don't integrate services in the humanitarian sector and we keep introducing different IDs and different wallets and different digital solutions to serve different purposes independently, we are exhausting the community. We are exhausting their bandwidth. We are misusing them as our agents as opposed to us becoming the service providers and the supporters for the community. So we definitely need uh, a solution that is interoperable. So with the gravity earth that I mentioned earlier, um, which is our consultant that has helped us design the system, we've explored even a business model. The three different business models that are here placed right in front is if the solution was entirely uh, held uh, with the gravity, with the consultant that is, um, the server and data storage by them, then they issue us um, the cost of the license, they issue us the cost of the setup fee and the participating cost of other natural societies. 
Uh, and then model two is where the server and the data is hosted by us as the, the lead of the consortium. Um, and they give us the license. They give us a, a small fee of setting this up. Uh, and we cover the cost of uh, the cost that we have basically covered helps us bring in five different national societies into the package. Um, and then, sorry, that's for model three. So model two is, of course, just for us alone. But model three is now we can introduce four more national societies uh, within the Red Cross Red Cross movement to be benefiting from this package. So these are all different pricing models that apply. Uh, we're still at the stage where we're finalizing something that is agreeable for a national society because again, the Red Cross is a funded organization. It doesn't, it's not profit. It doesn't uh, have money sitting around to continuously pay licenses every year. So we need to look at a very realistic figure of what it is we can definitely confidently pay every year. Because if we if we feel this is not agreeable and we can't afford this, then ideally the solution can't continue to be sustainable for a like, long period. So it comes to the final steps of what is next for us. Um, we are strongly advocating uh, with the government. We've had about four sessions this far. We've talked to the Minister of Interior. We've talked about we've talked to the Minister of Health. We've talked to multiple uh, departments within the government, both at the national and the county level, to try and also get a bit about their brains and see how they think about this. Because of course, even within Kenya, the national government has started introducing the idea of digital identities in the community, and they did test one in 2018, just around the time we launched this pilot. But again, for you to have a registered digital identity that was released by the government, at the registration point, you had to present your national ID. So it's still back to the square one where if you don't have a national ID, you can't get a digital ID either. So we're having these advocacy sessions with them, trying to see if we can do policy reforms as well, and just be able to explore more with other service providers uh, in, in terms of telecom services, if we can integrate more of these solutions into the mobile money transfer uh, packages. Um, and of course, trying to explore if we can make the solution more interoperable with other uh, organizations. So we've done this with the Confirmation Hospital, which is also based in uh, Turpana. Um, it's a private hospital, and we've uh, registered host communities. What we did is we trained the hospital uh, staff, and we allowed them to take leadership on how the host community members uh, are created digital wallets for, and how they interact with these wallets. So we try to be the lead in one component of doing the whole process on our own, and we try to let a partner do the whole process on their own, and then sit at a distance and observe, so that we're able to see what are the weak points, because what is great to us may not be great to someone else. So we're trying to document this whole process. Of course, if you want to read more, then you can read more in the, uh, the HIP platform, because we have all our articles that have been uploaded there as well. I have my contact details there, so I'm really looking forward to also, of course, uh, hearing from some of you on questions on this. But as I conclude, I'd like to say that where we are at this stage is we want this to continue. We want this to become a central humanitarian digital ID, uh, and this is in the context of Kenya, for instance, so that's been a us. But the idea is that this could really replicate in other countries. We, we don't need to exhaust our people. We don't need to uh, constantly look for funds to support the community, yet when you go to the community at the ground level and you talk to them, they will tell you they're tired of giving you information. They're tired of constantly sharing their data, which they have no clue where it goes, yet we have solutions like this, and I'm sure the discussions you've had uh, this morning also is around how do we have the digital world complement the, the groundwork so that we're not having community exhaustion in the process. And with that, I think I'm just going to say thank you so much for giving your time, and I apologize for the initial uh, glitches in, in our tech world. Thanks.